Hello, everyone. It is my privilege to introduce our speaker today, Mr. Safal Islam. Saf will be opening to us the fascinating lost world of Dhaka muslin, an incredibly fine cloth prized by royalty and the affluent for many centuries. Saf is a Bangladeshi dedicated to promoting Bangladeshi culture and history. Upon hearing of Dhaka muslin, an ancient ethereal muslin that was once made by skilled weavers within a small region and from a now extinct plant. Saf put his skills to work researching the textile's history and building its future. Saf studied engineering and business administration and worked in a number of multinational companies before settling in the UK and becoming CEO of DRIC, a world-renowned media company based in Dhaka, Bangladesh. While at DRIC, Saf assembled a team of photographers, researchers, photographers, and contributors who then formed a group of cultural activists focused on bringing muslin alive. He has researched and worked on muslin since 2014 and has held an exhibition, published a book titled Muslin, Our Story, and produced an award-winning film titled Legend of the Loom. He is currently Managing Director of Bengal Muslin and Majority. Please welcome our special guest coming to you from Bangladesh, Mr. Saful Islam. Thank you, Erika. Call me Saf. It's a pleasure to actually be on this uh, program of yours. Uh, the Jane Austen Society is a celebrated name. And uh, I, I hope that uh, whatever we have got to share within the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour will be of interest to your uh, members. Where would you like me to begin? Shall I go into the presentation mode? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, there is a share here and and are you being able to see that? Not. Are you being, not yet? Not yet. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, Is that any better? All yes. right. Okay. Sorry, sometimes the Mac is a bit too fast for us. Right. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. You know, I'm not sure that I deserve every compliment that you gave over there, but I'll try and uh, give you some idea about uh, what certainly is, as you mentioned over there, a very unique fabric, muslin. And the thrust of our work up till now has been about reviving our heritage. Uh, these are words which are rather not lightly taken by me. Bangladesh, I'm not sure about how much your members know about it. You might have heard a little bit about it. Um, it's a very, very small country. I mean, it's, um, it's known to be smaller than the state of Wisconsin, to give you an idea. And yet the population of Bangladesh is about 175 million people, which is almost half of the United States. So it's a very densely populated country. On top of it, it's a riverine country. So uh, the Himalayas sit on top in Nepal and the waters that come from there form about 700 rivers that flow through this country, which makes the country incredibly fertile, but also uh, very much susceptible to flooding. There's nothing we can do about these. These are the demographics that have been handed to us by, you know, by, by design. And therefore, uh, Bangladesh has struggled against the odds. It is performing very well today, but uh, sadly, a lot of its history has been overlooked. One of the primary reasons for it, I believe, is because Bangladesh was part of Pakistan uh, until it became independent in 1971. And Pakistan was in turn uh, a part of India until that became a separate country in 1947. So the layers of partition that have happened have confused uh, our 
origin uh, as being called as perhaps Pakistan or being called as India. And often our story, uh, as I mentioned over here, our heritage, or as my book says, Muslim, our story, is subsumed within the greater story. It's a bit like, um, I don't know whether the, it's, it's, it's the right um, approach, but perhaps you, know, you could say if the Mexican story becomes part of the Americas, uh, story, but then there are independent stories within them. So similarly, when it came to Muslim, uh, the identity, the origin, and the history of that particular fabric has often been confused with that of being an Indian story or an Asian story, and even more further than that. So these slides hopefully will give you uh, a little bit of an idea, and I hope it's an authentic, correct idea about this particular fabric. So I shall proceed with that. Uh, I know that we don't have a live audience. I'm more than happy to take your questions at the end. But uh, in addition to that, if your members have any questions after they've seen this program, I'd be more than happy to answer them you know, collectively or individually. Let's get on to just a question over here, which probably is very easy to answer, that what was common amongst these uh, figures in history, rather celebrated figures over here, I mean, if we start from the left, then you've got Sultan Selim, and that's the gentleman in the white turban over here. And he lived uh, from 1512 to, I think, 1574. So that's the 16th century Turkish Sultan, one of the most powerful, probably the founding member of the Ottoman Empire, which at one time was the biggest empire in the world. Uh, and these parts of the world have been ruled by empires for a long, long time. And then you go up to Nur Jahan, a very famous lady in our part of the world, uh, wife uh, of uh, the Mughal emperor and uh, a great connoisseur of the arts, a great patron of the fabric that we are discussing, which is Muslim over here. I think she was uh, 1577 to 1645. You go on to the French uh, empress over here, uh, Queen Mary Antoinette, and she was, uh, well, I think she was actually went under the guillotine during the French Revolution. And that was probably 1755 to something like 1792. So last part of the 18th century. You do have Georgina Cavendish, a name that I'm sure your members would be more familiar with. Uh, she lived in England, part of the, almost the Regency period that we are talking about sometimes. And uh, that's 1757 to about 1806. And um, again, a very celebrated socialite. We come to the particular lady that uh, you know you are all familiar with. You know far more about her than I do. Jane Austen. Um, I think she died at the age of forty-two in uh, eighteen seventeen, having written probably eleven or twelve of the most famous books um, in English literature. You come across Karl Marx, a radical socialist. I think uh, one of the great revolutionaries. Uh, whose book, Das Capital, 1818 to 1888. So that's, you're coming to the 19th century. And Leo Tolstoy, one of the greatest writers uh, of, um, of novels, you know, War and Peace and so on, 1828 to 1910. Now these celebrated people, you know, from uh, where you've got about, you know, four members of uh, royalty, you've got uh, two writers, you've got thinkers, had one thing in common, which is the question and the obvious answer to that is that uh, the central figure over here is a stole, which is uh, modeled of muslin. And every one of these people loved muslin. Sultan Selim, with whom we began, is wearing a white turban. And that white turban became an official part of the attire mm. of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it was, had to be of muslin. It is very long. It is actually about 22 yards, which is why, you know, it's kind of like that bulbous onion shaped over there. And you'll notice that in the history books, uh, the Ottoman emperors are wearing always, and even their ministers and uh, their advisors are wearing these turbans. Nur Jahan uh, was the one who actually almost catapulted muslin to the forefront of royalty. Mary Antoinette, uh, she loved it so much, uh, reports, uh, that when she was being executed and taken on a little cart, she chose to wear a muslin fichu, which is a kerchief around her neck, when uh, that neck went under the guillotine. Georgina Cavendish, uh, she 
gave um, the Duchess, the famous film about her, she gave Muslin as a gift to her niece who was going to marry the future prime minister of England uh, for her wedding. Sadly, the Muslin was delayed. It often happens with this craft that there's a delay in supply. The wedding had to be delayed, obviously, if the Muslin isn't there. And uh, Jane Austen will come more to her about her involvement, her fascination, her uh, at times real and metaphorical use of Muslin. Karl Marx is the one who rightly accused the English for destroying the industry. Leo Tolstoy wrote about it rather poetically in his work. So you have this range of personalities. And the question is that if they were all, you know, from approximately about four continents speaking about Muslin, what was special about it? So what was special about it? On the left uh, is a painting, okay, Renier, um, an Italian painter. This is very much available on the internet. So uh, it's of a lady, a Muslim lady, they say, uh, having a hookah, which is a uh, smoke over there wearing muslin. I think it just is evocative of the fabric itself, okay? And on the, on the painting below are the English, you know, slowly appearing on the scene. Now, one must remember that in the history of England, uh, they were the ones who actually established multinational co corporation. The first company, you know, uh, and you can uh, you can even go to William Dalrymple, the author for that. Um, the first company with shareholders actually, uh, very influential shareholders uh, who formed the East India Company in 1600 and then got the charter to actually do trade in spices and who quickly became from a trading company into a government by themselves and from a government became an army by themselves. And sadly, that uh, still continues to be the ambition of some multinationals you know, to not only co conquer trade, but to rule over countries. And that is what happened in this particular case with devastating results until they left in 1758. And then later on, the English government took over the reins of that company and continued to rule and exploit India until 18, well, 1947, from then onwards, you know. So 1757 to 1857, you have the East India Company, 1857, 1947, you have the British government over there. Uh, this particular one, uh, which is a map over here, shows the routes by which trading used to happen. It's very small, so I'm sorry that you can't really uh, see it very much. Therefore, muslin was one of the finest textiles, okay, as it says over here, achieving counts of up to 1,200. Now, for the non-initiated, and perhaps there's very few of them, uh, count designates the fineness of the cloth. So what I'm wearing over here, or perhaps what most of us are wearing are about 20, 30, 40 count, which means that the thread itself uh, a particular length, which is a thousand meters of it, weighs a certain grams. So if you have got two grams over a thousand meters, it's going to be something like 500 count. Now that is very difficult to achieve, especially when you do it by hand. So uh, to give you an idea, the human hair is probably about 400 count. So anything finer than that is extremely difficult to not only spin, but to weave. However, this is what this achieved uh, by hand for almost about and you could say in the region of about uh, debatable, but you could say almost in the region of about 700 to 800 years. And prior to print and social media, the second point, this fabric became a global brand. What's a global brand? And if I ask you, you'll probably say Nike, I don't know, Reebok, Apple, Samsung. But how do they become global brands? Everybody knows them because there is a lot of promotion behind it, behind the product, which is obviously excellent also. How do you promote a product in the second century BC when there's no social media, no internet, no hardly much known about the known world? And yet you had orders from Rome for muslin. You had orders from Indonesia for muslin. You had orders from China for muslin. You had orders from Afghanistan for muslin. Afghanistan, by the way, used to be a much, much richer country than it is today, as are so many of the other countries. And, and the reason was because of its sheer, I think, overwhelming human response to that fabric, you know, that this is a special, it is recognized as being special. Japan, even today, I mean, they ordered muslin. Uh, Romans would, would, would wait to get it, um, wait three years. And the third point is about the trade. 
when finally the East India Company was established and started trading, trading in opium, trading in timber, trading in tea, trading in silver, uh, trading in textiles, there was particular two years, I think it was 1768 or something, uh, when muslin alone represented 75% of the enormous trade uh, that the East India Company was doing. Now, previous to that, uh, to that Bengal was receiving the money directly. This time, of course, the East India Company was receiving the money. And um, Bengal, uh, from its very beginning, being a very fertile, as I said, riverine country. So here it is uh, in this tiny part where my cursor is. Okay. Uh, and here are the Himalayan mountains, which are the highest mountains in the world. So that's why it comes through here. Bengal used to be extremely fertile, uh, rich, and um, you know, very good in earning revenue for itself. And therefore it was influenced, it influenced fashion, as we know, you know, very fashionable to have muslin with you. Literature, Jane Austen, a perfect example of it, or Leo Tolstoy. And there are more, you know, Sh Shahid Aga, uh, many people have seen uh, muslin as that certain fine ethereal, you know, feeling, and it can be almost transposed in literature. Social trends, you know, when you had muslin, you had what you have got over here, the high bodies, the empire line, as they say. Trade, obviously, a direct contributor revenue. Politics, because uh, this was one of the reasons why bills were passed, amendments were made, laws were passed uh, in order to restrict muslin, in order to restrict the influence of Bengal, in order to actually cripple Bengal, in order to subjugate it. And these happened globally. So. Just a few points over here. And then from there, uh, it led to being exterminated by the English East India Company in the 19th century. So that's the news on the left, uh, which is probably a very common symbol for extermination. So the name Muslim is an English name. You know, people would like to know where it came from, all right? Uh, largely, it is believed that it came from the term that was used by Marco Polo. In, in 14th, uh, the 15th century, 1400, uh, when he went across to the city of Mosul in, in Iraq, you know, um, and saw uh, the fine cotton being traded over there. It is not the name of the origination of the place. So Mosul is not where Muslim originated. Mosul is where it was significantly being traded in order to go across to Arab or to Western countries over there. In Bangladesh, in India, in Bengal, it is never called Muslim. It is called Mal Mal. Okay. And I think that's a lovely name. Uh, and you can see that um, the, uh, a lady's hand and there's Muslim over there. That photograph was taken by me because when I started in 2014, as you mentioned, I actually started with a story in end of 2013, but the activity was in 2014 in the first quarter. I was underwhelmed. I was thinking, so what's so special? White cloth, finely woven. Okay, I saw samples in different museums. Um, until I came across this particular sample in a very private collection in, uh, in Calcutta, or Kolkata, as we say. And uh, they were uh, ex-royalty. They had their private collection. And over there, I saw, I think these are about 700 count. Uh, and, uh, you know, when it landed on my hand, I really didn't feel anything. I think the, all these stereotypical descriptions of muslin as woven air, the skin of the moon, you know, uh, the light, uh, you know, uh, and, and so on. These come true when you actually see something that fine and you begin to realize that every shred of that cloth, every spin was done manually. Okay, from one single plant that grew in this map of Bangladesh that I've shown. So you've got Dhaka over here. So around Dhaka is, are these rivers on the right side, uh, which are the Meghna and the Shitalokka. You can hardly see the names here. So the Meghna is written here. These come from the, the water comes from the foothills of Assam, which is in India, a hilly region. Whereas the others come from the waters of the Himalaya. So only along this stretch, only within a 40 kilometer stretch by two kilometers that muslin grew. It didn't grow along the rest of the 700 rivers 
The English tried to do that. They even took Muslim to India, to Gujarat, well, not to India, but to Kolkata, to Gujarat, and different places in India. 50 year experiment that ended in failure. The plant wouldn't grow there. Now one can actually say, well, that's a very small stretch of land. You know, any one of your probably Southern plantations produces more. So how could Muslim conquer the world? Uh, one of the reasons was because the primary plant, which we'll come to later, uh, was the finest for muslin. And you could actually weave uh, a six yard of cloth. That's how they wove it, because that's the length of sari, uh, into 100 grams of cotton. So one kilo would theoretically give you 10 bowls of cloth. So a little cotton went a long way. And the second was there were other variations of muslin, which also crept in. Okay, and there were accepted variations. There was, besides the plant itself, there was the cousin of the plant or something like that. And these would come in. And ultimately, it led to its dilution. There's no doubt about that. So it is, by definition, a hand-woven cotton fabric of hand-spun yarn from a special plant. And here I use the name, the Bengali name, the Bangla name, which is Puti Karpash. Okay, Karpash does mean cotton in our language. Puti means budding. So the budding mm -hmm. cotton cultivated on the banks of the river Meghna in East Bengal. There are two Bengals. West Bengal is in India. East Bengal is the country of Bangladesh where I'm sitting right now. So this is the kind of boring but exact definition of muslin. If you haven't got that special plant, which is extinct today, then you're not in muslin territory. But at least if you have hand spun yarn of hopefully above 250 count, that's the minimum, okay? hand spun uh, yarn and you have a hand woven cotton fabric, you still can claim that I'm near to muslin. Maybe not exact, but near to it, all right? Now, a little more about muslin, just a few facts. On the right is uh, one of the celebrated paintings. Again, you can see it on the internet, but I've seen it in real at the British Museum. It's uh, of a guard, you know, here he is standing tall. Uh, of the Mughals and, you know, bossing over one of the weavers as he produces. The reason for it is because they were very careful to ensure that the cloth wasn't stolen or sold to someone else. Cloth that had been ordered from the court, okay. Uh, as I said, they used to, uh, you know, order it way ahead, but then they would stand guard over it and make sure that the weaver wasn't cheating them by putting in any other cotton also. And these guards known as Gomusta, okay, these guards known as Gomusta, and this weaver will be known as a tati. So that's uh, the Bangla for a weaver. And, you know, this is probably a, just a covered part of his hut. It would be done in the shade. It would have water buckets around it or, you know, gourds around it in order to make the atmosphere humid. And in the second century, as the first point says, priestesses, so we're going way back, were banned from wearing it because as a priestess, you are just showing a lot of yourself, you know, if you were wearing mustin. And that is one of the, uh, one of the, I think the exotic challenges of wearing this, uh, this fabric. And Puti Karpash, as I mentioned earlier, was a five pointed leaf. Most cotton, and by all means to go near a cotton plant, you'll see it has three lobes. So it's got three kind of fingers and Puti Karpash had five. Okay, it is short, red stemmed. And as I mentioned earlier, experimented for 40 years. Romans uh, at those days, this is about a BC before Christ, would wait three years for the cloth. So if I'm a weaver and you're a Roman and you come to me and say, I need about 40 yards of this cloth, I'd say, okay, uh, you'll get it in 2025 and you pay all your money now. And the Roman would be happy with that, that someone's accepted the order. And it would go over land. Uh, at that time, uh, there was very little trading by water. So most of it would travel over what is now known as the Silk Route towards the right, which is China, and over the other route, which goes through Mosul and Turkey and finally Europe, okay. Water navigation started in the eighth century by the Arabs coming, okay, and the Islamic influences started at that time. And after the eighth century, the Arabs in India came the Portuguese around the 11th, and then you had the Dutch, and then you had the French, and then you had the English. The, these were the overseas, you know, kind of uh, invaders that came, settled, traded, but hardly, you know, they would have probably, uh, very rarely would they actually 
uh, sort of build the empire, the Mughal state, which happened in uh, 15th century, 1492 was when the first one was established and they came from Central Asia. Now, 8% of the raw cotton is usable. So you've got about 100 kilos of cotton. Why 8%? Because it would be, first of all, sorted for all the seeds and dirt, probably reduce about, you know, 25%. And then it would be cleaned with the jawbone of a fish, which is like a, a comb. And then it would be ginned with a very small instrument where the cotton would never touch the actual instrument because it was so delicate. It was just done by hearing uh, the, the strum of that particular bow that, you know, have we got the cotton separation right? And then the yarn would be spun, and even then it would be classified into three classifications by which the best would be used for muslin. Uh, spinning on boats and weaving uh, with flooded pits gave rise to myths and connections with water. So if you are spinning and you needed high humidity so the yarn would break, one of the techniques was that girls, normally it would be girls or women aged 18 to 25. After 25, your eyes would give out. So, you know, you wouldn't be able to spin very much roughly speaking. And um, and they would be doing it on a boat. So there's this rotating charka, which is uh, the spinning wheel. In those days, what was used for muslin was rather a vertical spindle, which is known as the takwa. Done on a boat because the humidity was around you. Done early morning or late evening, because that is when the sun is mild, you probably would be singing. Uh, if there was any men or Portuguese or anybody Arab passing by, he would be thinking that these are mermaids making the thread. And that's what the legend comes from. It is really, you know, women singing, spinning on a boat. And sometimes even the loom that you see on the right, there's a pit where the legs are kept. And that pit would be given water so that the water would rise from beneath. Nowadays, we use bowls of water. We always also use a humidifier, which is the fine spray. Uh, you know, you give for when you, when you feel that it's getting too dry. So we try and maintain a humidity of about 72 and above, uh, not go below that, and temperature also of a certain temperature. And um, the Mughals would wear only one special type of muslin. It was not sold to others. Now, the Mughal dynasty, one of the most richest, most artistic, most cultivated, uh, and far-reaching dynasty coming from Central Asia, brought with it uh, Arabic language, but mainly Persian language and a language of their own. So that influenced it. And the Persian, if you have any idea about us, sadly, Iran has been, uh, has been almost segregated, uh, but its culture is one of the richest, untouched uh, for the last 800 years. There's a continuity of designs and forms over there. And they're mainly geometric, you know, what you see in the mosaics and in the tiles. That influenced muslin greatly. And a particular type of muslin that came out of it was the richest, most expensive muslin, uh, known as Jam Ghani. I'll come to it a bit later. And that uh, one variety of the Jam Ghani, which is Malmal -mal Khas, which means Malmal muslin Khas means a special. So the special muslin was what the Mughals would use. Okay, it was a symbol of royalty. It was an extension of comfort also. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Georgina gifted muslin to her niece, Lady Caroline Lamb, for a wedding. And there goes the story. I mean, I heard it actually from the biographer of, uh, of Georgina, an American lady who mentioned it to me. There is one large uh, point at the bottom, which says that in order to crush the Muslim industry, because it was, it, it was seen that India was a huge market for cotton and could be supplied by the machine uh, cotton, which was being now invented in England, in the late part of uh, the 17th, well, actually the 18th, the beginning of the 18th century when industrial cotton came. Uh, weavers, their thumbs were cut off so that they couldn't weave anymore. Uh, I think there's a bit of um, misnomer over here. Uh, the thumbs of weavers are not that crucial, but the thumbs of spinners are crucial, very crucial, could have been spinners. Uh, this story is not made up by Indians by any chance. It's actually written by a Dutch person. And, uh, there is no uh, you know, documented evidence of it. And I believe there wouldn't be for any crimes that are committed by the rulers. Uh, but there are some court records which mention such, uh, such an act did happen. To me, uh, whether it's allegorical or not, uh, there's no doubt that the extortion and the repression of the English that happened over India 
was very close to being amputated. You know, uh, there were other means that they used, judicial means, non-judicial means, um, taxation and so on, uh, which actually almost snuffed out the industry. So just a few points over there. Uh, its journey, you know, it is said, as I said, there's a quotation about the priestesses. There are other quotations in books. Uh, and there is a period of time, which I would say from, let's say 1500 BC to almost about uh, 11, 1100 or let's say 800, you know, that particular period, it's pre-Islamic period and muslin was still being woven, okay? Uh, you get mentioned about the fine muslin. You can see in this particular statue that there is some drapery here. This is the one that has been picked by the English researcher, Sonia Ashmore. There are more statues which show much more clearly the patterns on the body, uh, which, is, uh, which is being the cloth being draped over here. Then there's a period between the, let's say the 15th uh, to the 18th century, where there's a Mughal influence. And I think the Mughals actually classified it, elevated it, uh, it became the royal item of wear officially. If you wove a very special type of muslin, that village would display the muslin on a sort of velvet cushion. It would be led by uh, like a wedding procession. It would be led by musicians and it would travel all the way to Delhi, which could be, you know, uh, maybe 700 kilometers away. Uh, with bugles blowing that this has been selected by the emperor. And that's why, you know, the Mughals were, wore it, as you can see, over their dresses, okay? They wore it without anything underneath, only if they were in harems or if they were, you know, like in private parties. And it happened in England also. In England, uh, women would wear muslin and they would wear huge coats over it because obviously it's very cold climate often over there. And the sales of Kashmiri coats, which are the thick coats, went up and the, and the Kashmiri shawls went up because muslin was being favored so much in English parties. So there is a period when the Mughals, I think, influenced a great deal. And then during that period when the English trading started, I think there's a degree of European influence over the dresses, over the attire, and over the growth of this industry. So you have these three parts of history where it comes through. All right, and muslin was being used from being just draped to something that was almost officially recognized as uh, you know the order of the empire, and ultimately it became uh, the fabric almost held English and European societies together because you could say that I am capable of getting this from India and I'm capable of wearing it. So you've got a lot of royalty, you know, Josephine, um, wife of Napoleon, her official portrait is in muslin, and. Uh, uh, at that time, it created a scandal around it. So you have the European tastes and the English humor. So, you know, muslin being so thin, you could see that how it was satirically displayed also uh, as very thin dresses where so you can see the body very revealing over here. You know, you can see the top and the bottom. Okay, over here, that's a windy day, but why would you wear muslin? And uh, there was even a satirical comment that he did not dress in muslin, you undressed in muslin. You know, so all you needed to do was to be in muslin was to take things off rather than to put them on. So these are very pretty well there. And from this English humor, we come to the Regency period. And I think you people know far more about it than I do, uh, certainly. When I was researching, uh, I visited Jane Austen's house in Hampshire. The photo on the right of uh, the muslin shawl over here taken by me stands in a bedroom, as you well know and uh, it's stitched with two pieces of muslin and they say the embroidery very simple embroidery on top of it was done by jane herself and there's a quotation in a letter where she says i'm sorry to tell you that i'm getting very extravagant and spending all my money and um, in a linen draper shop to which i went checked muslin and for which i was obliged to give uh, seven shillings probably a price of about 400 pounds today uh, and i was tempted to buy a pretty colored and bought 10 yards of so you know, it is being mentioned uh, by Jane. And as I said, there is a metaphorical connection to sometimes muslin was seen as being transparent, as being exactly what the heroine would wear. You know, you describe your feelings as being light, soft, strong, and uh, transparent. Uh, the white cloth that it was in the Regency period, I think after the Georgian period, uh, for approximately 20 years, was uh, the kind of delicate 
uh, in a period of society where there's a lot of blooming of the arts, there's acceptance of, uh, of many things from abroad, and, uh, and there was a fascination with you know, the opening up of the empire to all these activities. It was followed with, I think, the largest exhibition that was done of uh, the colonies in 1858, which led to the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum subsequently being formed. Uh, there were more than 9,000 items over there. One of the items that received, you know, and I've got empty newspaper cuttings of that, was muslin. Uh, uh, that's where you know, word of mouth actually spread. I think there were about 6 million visitors over there. So that's a huge number for the population at that time. Uh, and so this is how it, 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 it captured the imagination through books, through some of the newspapers over there, word of mouth. And you know, your first experience of muslin would always be uh, quite unique uh, and unforgettable. This then, uh, brings us to our journey. Now you've heard about me, uh, pretty boring stuff, an engineer, um, you know, I worked in multinational companies. I left, uh, in around 2013 when I decided that I'd just like to do other things. I've always been interested in the arts, uh, and, uh, had an enormous, uh, uh, and at the same time, I had an enormous interest in running companies too. So I think what I felt is that I could bring some amount of, uh, let's say, uh, effort to the search for Muslim. It was started by uh, an organization coming to me and saying that they wanted me uh, to help them to take Muslim to Bangladesh where it started. But at the same time, their amount of information wasn't enough. They didn't know about the plant. They didn't know about the cloth. They didn't know, uh, you know, they had no samples because all that had disappeared. And to me, uh, first of all, you start by thinking, okay, let's visit the places where it did exist. I mean, if you got to write about uh, Jesus Christ, you've got to go to Bethlehem. So to me, you know, let's go to the river first. And we traveled by river. You know, you can see Bangladesh over here. So from here to the top, Maiman Singh, where Muslim was also woven, we traveled about 400 kilometers, boat, collecting samples, speaking, then did research. Mm, uh, I think I got about 98 or 100 books. Some of them mentioned just a line, just a word, and some of them had a lot more. Uh, unfortunately, what I felt over there is that a lot of the time, Bangladesh wasn't mentioned, or most of the time. Even the latest book uh, didn't mention it. And I think this is where you feel that you're being overlooked unless you stand up and tell your own story. You know, uh, it, it is our responsibility. So in trying to find it, I also tried to visit other countries. So I went across to 11 countries, you know, it's shown over here where there's Netherlands, UK, Switzerland, Turkey, India, Jordan, France, the USA. The USA, uh, after its uh, independence from uh, being a British colony, actually sent ships to Kolkata and, uh, in, and brought in Muslim. But over a period of time, uh, the confusion in the USA has been that it has often associated muslin with uh, just a cloth, a thin gauzy cloth that is for jam manufacture or for babies' nappies or for you know photography backgrounds. Uh, even at one time, it confused it with calico, uh, which was worn by slaves and so on. So there's been confusion in a lot of parts of the world because of the extinction of the story, because of the distortion by imitation products also. So we started off with that background and we researched it for about 26 months. Uh, and this is the way we went. Uh, this is the trust that first introduced us. We did four things. They searched it 2014 until in 2016, we held our exhibition and published the book. We did search for the cotton. We started to look again at spinning and weaving. And we also decided to share as we are doing today uh, and exhibit products over there. So that's kind of the journey over here. In the research and acquire phase, uh, you know, information from people and organizations. So this is kind of the, the, the academy over here. These are some of the crafts people that I met. They're very well known in uh, this part of the world. This is an ancient book, Cotton Manufacture of Dhaka, anonymously written, most likely written by James Taylor, uh, a resident over here. Super book, it details the, the story of Muslim and uh, was one of the really original sources of information except that it gets uh, some of the locations and perhaps the subsequent stages of Muslim a little bit different, but otherwise uh, a very good one. The, all the museums from the Victoria and Albert and so on. I mean, one of our, my celebrated almost photographs of Muslim was taken from the Yale Center. 
uh, of arts where I asked them about muslin, they said they had nothing, but they actually had a very, very good painting of people wearing it. You know, the difficulty was in recognizing it as muslin or even spotting that there is muslin in that painting. So this is Turkey, where I visited the Topkapi Palace and the museums, uh, a lot of places, you know. Uh, I would say the concentration of muslin has been uh, in India, where it's been with the Nawabs, and in England, where there are, you know, there, there are obviously acquisitions by them. And then there are museums around the world, even the MoMA, you know, where there are some special pieces uh, of muslin. Sadly, Bangladesh itself has hardly anything of muslin left, uh, you know, over the years. Most of it or all of it has almost disappeared. Uh, you know, a metric traders, this is another muslin piece that I had bought. This is part of a turban. And this is another one that you saw originally. This is the stole, which is uh, embroidered in Dresden. And so collecting, collecting, watching, steeping myself into this. In the cotton, this is the cotton. This is a painting of the cotton plant. You can see the five fingers. You can see the red stem. And this little green leaf over here is the cotton that we have grown, which is, as I said, almost a 70% match. Uh, and it grown along the riverbanks. This is a book in Bangla, the first and almost only book in Bangla about muslin, bit of a translation, uh, 1962 that it was published. And then we searched the rivers, you know, these are vast rivers uh, in, in Bangladesh. I think the uh, amongst the world's top 10, they're probably uh, number seven, number nine and 10, you know, through through uh, our country passing through, showing pictures, offering rewards. This is the Kew Gardens, Dr. Mark Nesbitt, uh, scientist over there. He showed me the fossilized versions. We collected the DNA from here, matched it with living plants, cultivated them, and then came out with the match because I wanted to be scientifically accurate about it. Uh, this is growing the plants. Here you see more plants and here you see the DNA. Uh, research being done. So 70% DNA match with Kuti Kapash fossil uh, that was done. And we continue to grow a uh, quantity, a little quantity of it, mix it with other cotton, continue to, you know, uh, spin and weave it. Okay. Uh, in the spinning and weaving, these are spinners, but unfortunately what they do over here in Bangladesh, this is a photograph of a spinner in Bangladesh, is uh, coarse weaving, not fine. This is India where there is fine weaving, but very little of it is done by hand now. It's done on a manual kind of a wheel at the moment that where the 300, 400, 500 ones are done. But these are the machines on which they are done now. So you can see the progression from here to here. The yarn, this is probably about a 500 count over here. It is then processed. As I said before, you had 16 different steps for processing, each of them historically done by a separate community, separate caste, separate gender separate religion almost. Today, those don't exist so strictly, but it's still a lot of the processing is done by women over here. These are the weavers community as they weave that. And um, this is our master weaver, his hand over here, when he first wove 300 count, and then we went to 400 count. Uh, samples are now, have been taken by um, the British Museum also from us and other places. And these are the ladies wearing what we have woven as muslin. Uh, 300 count, you following classical designs, okay? Uh, and that's what we also do over here. So Bengal Muslim would do that in addition to continue with the research and uh, the information sharing. So in the share and exhibit, uh, we did seminars over here, okay? We filmed uh, and uh, we, over here you can see the exhibition that was held in uh, 2016, so it's been a, some time back. Uh, these are uh, tourists abroad. We had a cultural show and we also had a book over here and the film that you mentioned earlier. So our effort has been to essentially reclaim the story, say that the story began here, whatever shape it is in now, but the story began here first. Second, uh, to show that the DNA in the weavers still can uh, manufacture that, uh, that particular muslin and that we are close to it, okay? Uh, to that fabric. And third, to bring recognition to the artisans, because I think we're just storytellers, but the artisans themselves would be the ones to do it. So ongoing, we continue to cultivate. We have these muslin, you know, you can see the modeling of it and different varieties. I'm only interested, there were five major varieties of muslin, uh, you know, including this, uh, these kind of 
flowered and figured. This is the one made of beetle wings. Okay, very heavy piece, very unique. Again, we just try and resurrect what we see abroad uh, into these pieces. This is the one for the British Museum that has been taken. Uh, we have also been involved in what is, I mentioned earlier, the Jamdani, which is a type of muslin for there. And we have worked upon making the weaver's pit looms. You saw the earlier pictures of it, those drawings. Things haven't changed for them over these 2000 years, but we have tried to make them now modern with good uh, lighting and ventilation and seating. So none of the practices have been changed, but the conditions have been. And is spreading the story. This is me on the BBC, but uh, uh, that is being told over here. So that's where I began from trying to first define to you what the impact of muslin had, what is muslin, and then its uh, ongoing revival, what was special about it, and its ongoing revival. Uh, I probably have uh, now coming to the last slide in terms of more information. Uh, if anybody is interested, certainly you can visit our website, Bengal Muslin. You'll find umpteen information over there and pictures. The book is available. The book has been also turned into a, into a graphic novel or a comic for children. So, you know, 274 pages uh, are turned into 20 pages of uh, cartoons, but it tells the story because to me, it's about inspiring the younger generation. And then there are, there are the fabrics over here. We don't sell regularly, but we do sell uh, any item that we feel we can manufacture. So ensure that we have uh, samples, we're confident about inspiring people. And then if we can replicate it, we do sell it also. Okay. And that's my uh, email over here, uh, available for anybody that wishes to contact me on this. That's Bangla for Dhunnabad. So, Erika, thank you very much. I'm not sure whether I've gone above the time or not, but it's. Uh, I hope you could follow what I was saying. Over to you. Yeah, no, it was great. Thank you so much, Saf. Um, let's, uh, can you just press, I think you should be able to click stop sharing. There we go. Let me just see if I can get this off my screen. All right. Well, I do have a couple of questions that came up while you were speaking. That was really mm -hmm. fascinating and just so so many parts to it. I I, I see why you <laughs> devoted your life to this this quest. Of course, we're all wondering because everything is all about Jane Austen. What do you feel the likelihood of a uh, not so wealthy clergyman's daughter? being able to uh, find and or purchase? Uh, do you feel that she at any point may have actually seen the very, very fine and the, the, the most uh, valuable of the Taka muslin in her day? I do think that she saw it. And more important than that, I do think that uh, she appreciated it. So sometimes, you know, when people say that, what is muslin to me? I say, well, it's white and it's light, but that, uh, you know, you can have a lot of stuff which is light and white, but it's not muslin, but muslin used to be that. So to be able to hold muslin and to see uh, the uniqueness of it um, is really something that uh, would be for very sensitive people. And I think Jane Austen was an incredibly sensitive writer, obviously. So muslin was starting to come, in, uh, come into English society uh, by the, you know, by the late uh, 18th century. So, you know, 1750s onwards, Muslim was coming in because a new class besides royalty, which is the Nobu-Rish class, you know, you had the business people, you know, who were, who were uh, uh, you know, getting hold of uh, other items and developing tastes over here. So there was, there's a street over here, Liverpool Street in London, where a lot of the uh, as they call it, uh, the textiles, the haberdashery, you know, all that stuff used to come over here. And then it would be uh, going over London. Uh, at one time, uh, I went to the Museum of London and um, they have court records over there. And interestingly, I found, I think about 26 cases where a magistrate uh, was sitting on a case of somebody who had stolen gold, silver and muslin. 
Now, it was written over there that this person who was a maid or probably an assistant or a butler had taken six yards, even two yards of muslin and some silver from their lady. So to be for a fabric to be mentioned as you know an item in the same breath as that and to be actually brought to court means that there was a value to it. Okay. And I think uh, that was England at that time. Jane Austen was extremely receptive to what was happening. Okay, she understood social classes that were rising up. She observed them, she captured them, and she saw Muslim and she appreciated it. There's no doubt about it. She did come into money, I think, in the later part of her life when uh, you know some amount of money was being given. I think she lost out on her first novel, but later on, you know, she was able to actually get some money in the later part of her life. So mm -hmm. yes. Uh, she certainly saw it. Uh, I certainly believe that uh, she appreciated it. And it was to her more than a fabric. It was to her something that reflected the upcoming changing uh, luxury tastes of England. If you were to look into the future of your company and your, and your quest here, um, uh, do you envision in a 5, 10, 20 year plan that that the manufacture and distribution of this muslin will become a more and more uh, a larger part of the Bangladesh um, economy? Um, economically, probably not. And the reason for it is because, you know, today our economy is based upon a huge amount of, uh, of uh, uh, garments which are manufactured in the factories over here and sold in the West or even uh, sold in uh, besides the West other countries also okay uh, it is also dependent economically upon you know other raw materials whether they're pharmaceuticals or tea and so on like that okay now hand handcrafts you know uh, sit and nurture a very large part of the population but that is more of a subsistence economy where you live, and you survive by handicrafts. You know, you can do well, but you can't do, you know, you can't compete at those levels of the economy where there are industries and factories. But within handicrafts, there's another segment, which is textiles. And a large part of the textiles we wear, like for example, this uh, Punjabi that I'm wearing is, is handloom, but it's not muslin, it's just simple cotton dyed. Uh, and people like these eco-friendly, casual, comfortable, you know, uh, and uh, something which contributes to society, okay, by, by buying this. So there is an element of that. Now, within that, they have come under pressure because of the machine manufacture, okay? And so there's a pressure. We have to do it the other way around. Instead of cutting costs, as I tell the weavers, what you have to do is define something special, something that cannot be achieved, something that has a story behind it. And that's where muslin has come in and played a role. So today, as our hand looms have continued to go down and down in quality, muslin's come up as a role model and it's occupied the top of the pyramid. And I think by doing that now, the hand loom that is being manufactured, they're commanding prices they've never heard of before. It won't be huge volume. It won't be having a huge market, but It'll, hey, it'll be something special. You know, you don't have Christmas turkey every day, but it's something mm -hmm. special. That's right. Are there any uh, fashion designers that have contacted you or textile designers that um, are interested in working with this, this cloth in, in the larger market? Yes and no. I mean, they have contacted and we have designed and we have done not only uh, like modern dresses, like skirts and tops and blouses to saris, which are the traditional ones, okay? And uh, they have worked with us on these items, but there isn't a big volume of it. Uh, there's more demand from India. And I think the reason for it is because India's ahead in terms of thinking of fusion designs. That is, you make a collar of muslin on a Levi's jacket. That looks special, all right? So, something like that. And they mm -hmm. created fusion designs. I think Bangladesh uh, doesn't do fusion designs as well, but it's looking at that. To me, you know, the traditional uses of muslin as a sari, which is draped around the body or as a stone or as a scarf is sufficient to build the market and keep it alive and, and even spread the story. To me, the muslin we weave is a platform for showing the reality of this story, okay? And it's a way of inspiring people in the future, okay? Uh, but uh, in terms of actually 
working with the fashion industry. I work with the fashion design and college. I work with the fashion design and university. I try and uh, tell them that there's a rich history of motifs and products that they can tap into, you know, and perhaps tapping into that and blending it with what they do is a way forward. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Saf. That was just fabulous. And I know uh, everyone shares my enthusiasm. We really appreciate you coming to us via Zoom to share this wonderful story. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Erica. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Okay. I don't know whether it's too late for you over there or not. Apologies if it is. But, <laughs> no, uh, no, no, it's, it's all right. Okay. This is perfect timing. <laughs> Thank you okay. so much. Okay, I'm glad for that. It was perfect <laughs> for me too. My day is just about to begin over here. Okay, so I'm probably, very uh, good. Dashing off. But do keep in touch. Yes, and as I said, you know, uh, you do visit the UK if you're around over there or